So this is Bill Ryan from Project Avalon, and it's Sunday the 9th of January 2011, and I'm making this little video with the help of my friend Ruth, who is known as Sepio on the Project Avalon forum. And she's supporting me here with a question and answer session to enhance and to complement the video interview with an insider with the pseudonym of Charles, which I released on the 1st of January. Uh, right now, as I talked to you, it's nine days ago. And that interview had had an interesting response. Um, it was a little bit like dropping a big rock in the pond, and the ripples have been spreading and the boats have been rocking, and a lot of people got quite upset, and people said all kinds of stuff, none of which is true. But it does need a backstory, it does need some enlargement, it does need a commentary. And this is what Ruth is going to assist me with today. Ruth, do you want to say hello to the people watching yeah, here? Yeah, people might know me from the Avalon Forum under my name, Sepia. And here I find myself in this funny situation, sitting behind the camera, trying to ask you questions. Would you like to tell again how you met Charles? Okay. Um, the story is told in the interview itself. The summary is that uh, he emailed me with brevity and courtesy and suggested that it would be valuable for me to talk to him. I picked up the importance of the message and on the 1st of August we talked on Skype for four hours. It was one of the more extraordinary conversations uh, in my life. And he introduced himself by saying that he had been ordered to deal with me because I had become a problem. And then he said that he wasn't going to do as he was ordered and uh, instead he was going to support what I was doing because he'd found out a little bit about who I was. And once again the story of that is told in the interview. We met eventually on the 18th of December where to my surprise, because I never thought it would happen, he consented to a video interview that was recorded with his real voice, but with his, his face hidden. That's what this commentary is all about. Before you met him in person, you spoke to him quite some time. Oh yeah. I, um, we logged over several months, over 30 hours of Skype conversations. What kind of a person is he? He is somebody who was used by the insiders as a resource for them. His job was to make problems go away. He would probably smile when I said that he's the kind of person who one would be glad to have on one's side when faced with a problem or any kind of a situation. He is intelligent, he does not have a formal education, he's not an academic, he's not a historian, he's not a scientist. He was a resource, he was an asset of the controlling group and spent many years uh, attending meetings. He was in the room where the decisions were made by the global controllers about uh, events and decisions that they were making about global affairs. So he, he was trusted. He's smart, he's cautious about what he says, he's honest, he has shown to me that he keeps his word. I would say he's tremendously courageous and I would say that he's one of these people who one could, uh, one could describe probably quite accurately as being uncontrollable. Does Charles have any special abilities, like psychic abilities? He's got some remarkable psychic abilities, very strong psychic abilities, which I've experienced at first hand, and others who he's been in communication with have experienced as well. It does seem like, like many, many of the insiders, who you could call the insiders, some of them insiders in intelligence, we've encountered this before, and some of them in the bloodline families, they have these abilities, they have psychic powers. I mean, that sounds very esoteric. Um, Charles says, this is nothing special. 
it's just a natural process. It's a natural thing that everyone's got. But um, the, the public have been educated to believe that these things are unreal, they're imaginary, they're, they're somehow kind of new agey mumbo jumbo and they're to be laughed at, and they are not. They're used as tools of the trade by the insiders and by um, people in Charles's role, which is a kind of quasi-military role. They use these abilities. So in that case, he would be a perfect person for some kind of intelligence group or any organization who need a person with special abilities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know, for example, that the, uh, that the Russians and the Americans have spent billions of dollars on research programs trying to enhance people's abilities for remote viewing, remote influencing. They, uh, there was all the work that was done by Hal Putoff and company in the in the Stanford Research Institute of the 1970s uh, with Yuri Geller and Ingo Swan. All of this is very well documented in the public domain. Mm. Uh, Jim Myers wrote a wonderful book about this called Psy Spies. But when you've got somebody who's already a bloodline member, as Charles is, and who has these abilities, he was born with these abilities, he, didn't, he, he had a little bit of an enhancement, meaning he was trained and he had some of these things brought out. But basically, he was born with these abilities, and so they use these resources that they have available to them. That's why he, one of the reasons why he was inducted into their world, not only because he was a warrior, and because he was smart and capable, and he was able to make their problems go away for them, but also because of his abilities that, as he described, often prevented problems from rising in the first place. And that's better than having a fight on your hands. So we could actually say that he didn't have a chance to choose a different way in his life. He was brought up in this tradition, so to speak. He was singled out from a very early age when he was a kid. He'd been watched all the time. He didn't realize what was happening until he was into his late teens and twenties. That's when he realized that there was more to him than he knew but other people have been watching him all the time. In the meantime, when he was young, he was a hooligan, and, he, and his, 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 um, uh, his capabilities in that, in that um, world were, were, were noticed and taken advantage of. For instance, he describes, I don't think this is in the video, but he told me how when he was a teenager, he was utilized to go into, um, Greenpeace demonstrations and cause trouble so that the demonstrators would would be um, uh, antagonized by the police and so on and so forth. We know that this kind of thing happens. We don't often get the chance to talk to someone who says, yeah, I did that kind of thing. I was, I was asked to do it and so I did. Why did he suddenly decide to work together with you? Yeah, that, that's, this is a critical question. As he describes in his interview, um, he, had a, he had a certain experience which effectively deprogrammed him. And this is a bit of a caricature, I'm, I'm sort of encapsulating this. But he woke up and he thought, wait a minute, I don't have to do all this stuff mindlessly that they're asking me to do. I'm my own man and I can make my own decisions. And that's what he started to do. Now he didn't announce it to them straight away, that became clear when he was asked to contact me to deal with me because I was a problem and then he didn't do as he was asked. That's when everything changed. Okay, so behind Charles there is some kind of a group. Could you make it easier to understand for people who these people are? Yeah. In just a few moments ago I made reference to the fact that he had spent a lot of time in the room where the decisions were made by what effectively is the capstone of the pyramid. This is not the Illuminati, it's not the Freemasons, it's not the Rosicrucians, it's not the, the Skull and Bones, it's, it's a group that's senior to all of that, that has no name, and it consists of the senior bloodline representatives, the senior representatives 
uh, chosen on a particular criterion, and I don't know what that criterion is, of the 33 major bloodlines that are on the inside. Um, and th this, is all a, this is a little bit of a loose analogy, but you can regard them as families, you can regard them as families who know what's going on. Charles said that they've been in control of the planet pretty much for 17,000 years. I don't know whether that's an accurate figure, but it gives an order of magnitude that I find very believable. And this group, as an international group, um, based in the UK, is the group that is calling the shots. They have tremendous power, tremendous wealth. They've had this power and this wealth for a very long time and they are senior to every other group. It's the controlling group, as best I understand it. And these are the people who Charles has reported to and who has worked with and who knows in person. It's, it's, it's as senior as it gets while you stay on this planet. I would like to know a little bit more about this group. Are these the, the same beings always incarnating in the same bloodline, or how can I understand this? Charles has never gone into this. I think these are good questions. I'd like to ask these questions to him. But in all the conversations we've had, and we've talked about a lot of stuff, what people could call the spiritual aspect of this, or the aspect of who we are and who they are as immortal beings, temporarily occupying bodies, that was not discussed. The emphasis from Charles's viewpoint, and it would seem from the controlling group viewpoint, is it's all about DNA, it's all about bodies, it's all about bloodlines, and ultimately it's all about eugenics. So it has never been expressed if they understand themselves as spiritual beings? This has never been discussed. That's all I can say. My personal opinion is that I'm sure that they do. I know from conversations with Charles, from personal conversations with him, that he is well aware that he's an immortal spiritual being temporarily occupying a body. Mm. He's complete, this is obvious to him, he knows this. Yeah. Just as many people watching this video know this. But he's never talked about how this fits in to the scenario and the plans and the philosophy and the operating modus operandi, the principles, how they work, of the insiders. I personally would like to think that these beings don't lose their memory from one incarnation to the other. They are in this controlling function for many, many thousands of years. It's an intelligent speculation and I'd like to ask that question and I don't have the answer and we're just guessing. It makes sense, but I have no idea. I really don't know. These people who belong to this controlling group, are they at all known in the open? No. Um, Charles did not tell me their names. I did not ask for their names. And there's an important reason for that. At one point, Charles was actually tempted to tell me one or two names although they wouldn't actually have meant anything to me. These are not people in the public domain. These are people who are very, very hidden. And we were very well aware that everything that we were talking about was being monitored and listened to. Of course it was. I said, don't tell me any names. I don't need to know. It wouldn't mean anything. It's more important to understand why they're doing what they're doing, to understand their thinking, to understand their philosophy, to understand their rationale, to understand the nature of the game that's being played I didn't want to get personal and I wanted to show that I didn't want to get personal as an indication of the fact that I wanted to be, let me say it, I wanted to be an English gentleman. These are principles that are important to them. It's important to, to play the game that way. There, there are ancient protocols, there are, are principles and rules of engagement in place that in my view is very smart to recognize and so I haven't wanted to tread on their toes. I haven't wanted to insult them. I haven't wanted to interfere with their personal affairs but as a group 
as an operating group like the board of directors of Corporation Planet Earth, I wanted to establish a dialogue and I wanted to show them that I was maybe what Charles called in his interview with me, a worthy contestant. In other words, somebody who they feel that they can do business with, who can be trusted, who's not gonna, who's not gonna badmouth them, who's not gonna break his word, and who can act as, uh, what, what word to use, as, as a negotiating representative of the alternative community, who are the only community who really are aware of what's happening. They're aware of some of what's happening and justifiably concerned about what's happening. And so the opportunity to open up a dialogue was what was really important to me. Now, I know the original question was, did he say anything about these people personally? I didn't need to know those details. So let's go back these, let's say, 17,000 years. What started at that moment? Oh. Well, 17,000 years is recent history. One of the first things that Charles explained to me was that, in his own words, the human race is an experiment. Um, you could regard it as a project, but basically it's a created situation set up on planet Earth as the ideal environment where several hominid species were established on this planet and Charles thinks that this was about a million years ago. He's not a historian or an anthropologist but that's what he understood. And then the, the initiators of the project stepped back to allow these humanoids, these early humanoids, to breed with each other, to handle things, to sort things out, to, to, to evolve and develop uninterfered with. They stepped back and let, let this ball roll. And this seems to be a genetic experiment or a genetic project. And the outcome seems to be something to do with the optimization of DNA or the optimization of the genome that has evolved in a natural way. And there's some kind of principle or protocol in place here that rather than create something to design in, a, in an advanced laboratory, assuming that this is possible. They're allowing this DNA, our DNA, the human genome, to evolve and to optimize itself under natural conditions over a long period of time using planet Earth as the Petri dish, as it were. A Petri dish is just a little sort of um, a controlled environment in a laboratory where little bugs are grown. And I'm not saying that humans are little bugs, I'm just saying that it's a controlled environment in which um, changes take place and then they're observed and they're monitored. And it's all with an outcome in mind. Now, Charles doesn't know who the, the ET originators of this situation were, but they're doing this for a reason. They're doing this because of some purpose that they had some goal that they had, or some problem that they were trying to solve. And the current controlling group, because you asked about the 17,000 year thing, this yeah. is very, very recent. This is just like the last five minutes of the day, you know. That controlling group has come to the top of the pile on planet Earth in a natural way. Like in business, if all is fair in love, war and business, then they have risen to the top. A lot of this is about controlling power and it's about controlling wealth. And because they've risen to the top and they feel that they have deserved it, this justifies it for them. Because they are also in possession of the history, this history exists in artifacts and documents in the Vatican Library and elsewhere. It's not in the public domain but they have it, they know this stuff, they know the history of the human race. And they regard themselves as being the guardians, as doing a responsible job. They see themselves, like the chief executives of a corporation, as being responsible 
for the survival of the corporation, for the optimization of the product that that corporation creates, the management structure of planet Earth, on behalf of the experimenters. That's, that's how they see their role. And as I, as I explained in the interview that I did with, with Charles that was released on the 1st of January, there's a very sensitive issue here. Now, I'm not trying to, to justify anything. I'm reporting it. But just like in the, the way that a corporate board of directors thinks about a big corporation when there are too many workers and the corporation is no longer efficient, then they let people go. They let some of the workforce go to get the whole thing leaner and meaner and more efficient. So they care about the company, but they don't care about the workers. And I believe that that is a rough analogy. And they would say, we care about the human genome, but we don't care about individuals. That's not our job. Where does this stand in comparison to everything that David Icke says? Where are the other groups, like the reptilians, the Anunnaki, call them whatever you want, where are they? They also have their intentions, they also have their power games. Is there anything said about this? The only intelligent thing I can say about this is that there are many groups, there are many factions, there are many agendas, there's a lot of compartmentalization, and in my personal view, there are likely to be off-planet influences, um, maybe astral, non-physical influences, which are way beyond the intentions of the group of ETs that actually started this experiment or started this project. There are lots of other things going on. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. I think it's a massive complexity. I do not have the details. Charles does not have the details. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions which I've got which have not been answered and those few questions that you table there are among them. But we can assume that there are many, many groups and very soon we come to the point where we try to differentiate or it's in the nature of humans to differentiate between good and bad. Who is the good one? Who is the bad guy? It's a difficult subject. This is the kind of conversation that's really hard to have because everyone gets upset about it. Let's just be God for a moment. And I don't mean that sacrilegiously. Let's just take the highest viewpoint we possibly can do. We're looking at over all of creation, okay? And this is possible for humans just to adopt that viewpoint for a little bit. Some people do it in meditation. When one's out of the game looking in on it, when you're out of the fishbowl looking in on it, when you're out of the movie looking back on it, good and bad are kind of temporary artificial constructs, okay? And ultimately what you've got is you've got spirituality doing its thing, you've got beings playing games, you've got people solving problems, you've got all kinds of drama and theatre, and you've got the whole movie, if you like. And so, sometimes it can be helpful to think in terms of good and bad, and sometimes it's not helpful to think in terms of good and bad. And let me enlarge on that a little bit, because I think this is important, if I can find a way of making the point. Since the first video was released, there's a lot of anger has been triggered, and I understand that. that it's like now that people have got a target for their anger, some of the anger is against Charles, some of it is against me. It's like, how can you talk to this guy? You know, he's working for the dark side. This is the, the sort of Star Wars analogy. Um, how can you dialogue with these people? How can you even represent them? How can you try and explain what it is that they're doing or why? How can you even be talking like this on camera? How dare you? You're betraying us. All of this kind of stuff. And that's not productive. I can understand that kind of reaction, but it's not productive. Because fighting doesn't work. It really doesn't work. All that does is it just precipitates us into the next situation and we've got to fight about that and so on and so forth. At some point, you've got to step outside of this fishbowl and you've got to say, look, we're all in this together. The 
One of the most important things that happened in South Africa, for example, after apartheid, that was a, a, um, a sort of microcosm equivalent of a lot of the, the, the larger, more nasty things that have been happening on planet Earth. There was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that said, OK, we're not trying to punish anybody here, but we've got a kind of amnesty, but the truth has to be told. And the truth has to be told in order to let it go. And this is the way in which I regard this question about good and bad. It's like, look, we can sit in judgment all we like, but it might not help change the situation. It might alter the situation in various ways, but it's not going to transform the situation. And to transform the situation, we've got to get above dualistic thinking. We've got to get above creating an enemy and fighting it, because that won't work. It really won't work. We have to set up, establish or create or envision the kind of global equivalent of, of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission where we say, all right, look, we're looking back and it's been a big mess and a lot of people have done a lot of unwise things and a lot of people have made judgment calls which are not maybe the best for everybody and some people have tried to solve problems in a way that just created more problems and we look around us and planet Earth is a mess. So what can we all do together? Let's forget about the good and bad. What have we got? Who are we? Where are we? What resources do we have? What do we know? Let's all tell the truth and let's fix this situation because planet Earth is too beautiful to trash. The human race is too beautiful to, to destroy. People are very, very remarkable. The human race is remarkable. I suspect that the extraterrestrials understand that there's something very remarkable that's being created in this human genome. And I often have wondered, I've asked questions that I haven't seen asked elsewhere, like the extraterrestrials out there with their extraordinary advanced technology and their mental abilities and their spiritual capacity. But do they dance? Do they climb mountains? Do they do acrobatics? Do they, do they have skateboarding competitions? Do they have comedy? Do they have their own version of Mozart and Da Vinci and, Leon and, and, and Rembrandt? We don't know the answer to these questions, but the human race can be very, very terrible, but the human race can be remarkably wonderful in, in extraordinary ways. And I personally speculate whether there's something here in the human genome that is regarded as extraordinary and maybe even unique. Those very traits that make us so extraordinary also contribute to making us dangerous and unpredictable in some way because we express ourselves. We express ourselves in such remarkable ways and sometimes we express ourselves violently and thoughtlessly. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is how remarkable the human race is, how we all have to work together, how this is the commonality that we've got. And I think that, that slipping into a good, bad, judgmental paradigm doesn't help us here. We have to be the change that we want to see in the world, which is what Gandhi said. And that means that if we want to see a better world, we have to start behaving in a way that's representative of that world. So I don't want judgment, I don't want retribution, I don't want more fighting, but I do want understanding. And it's towards that understanding that I published that video on the 1st of January and I'm also publishing this. I would like to go back now to the controlling group and to their intentions. It is expressed that they are only interested in DNA. In certain situations, the beings learn to take responsibility. The beings become creative. The beings become violent. The beings become loving and caring. These abilities grow and they are also becoming part of the DNA. Could yeah. this be a factor why, why this experiment is going on and on and on? It... I understand why you're asking. This experiment is being conducted in a natural environment with all the richness of culture and society over hundreds of thousands of years contributing to the product of the DNA, to the evolution of the DNA, which can't be created in a laboratory somewhere, in my view. 
because Darwinian natural selection isn't the whole story at all. You're talking about a Lamarckian view, which is about the, the, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. This was the... Uh, he was a French biologist. His name was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Um, you can go look him up. And he was a sort of um, a geneticist heretic because he argued that, that it's possible for experiences and learning that have been absorbed and acquired during an individual's lifetime that they also are passed on to our children, and this is one of the prime evolutionary mechanisms. And he was branded as crazy for quite a long time. There are now some evolutionary biologists who do not believe that it's quite as crazy as that. And while Charles is not a scientist, Charles has explained in his own words that it is understood on the inside that these mechanisms operate. It's not just about whether an animal survives long enough to have offspring. And then, and then it all just kind of passes the parcel down that line. There is growth and there's learning and there's development. And when you've got human beings involved, you've got, a, you've got consciousness that is riding in these vehicles. And the learning of the consciousness is also somehow absorbed and transmitted in the DNA. And so the whole thing is very multidimensional, the way that this DNA evolves. It's my strong suspicion, very, I mean, almost a certainty, really, that the, that the ETs who, who, who initiated this project, that they understood this perfectly well, but they can't engineer this as a completed product to their specifications. They have to allow this to manifest in a natural way. They couldn't create an apple in the laboratory. They had to grow it organically in the garden and sit and wait for it to grow. And, and, and why they're doing this, we can only speculate. But it's a pretty wonderful thing that they're doing. And we don't know about the ethics of the ETs, except that, according to Charles, he's mentioned this many times to me, they will not interfere in their experiment. They have a strict protocol that they won't interfere at all. That is letting this ball roll. What's happening on the inside is something totally different. This is not intended by the ET experimenters. It wasn't intended, for instance, that for the first time in all the cycles of human history, we've got hold of extraterrestrial technology now, in our generation. This never happened before, and was not intended to be part of the experiment. And now you've got this dangerous situation, that not only have you got this extraordinary, wonderful, creative, expansionist, expressive and often very violent and aggressive human nature that we all have. And for anyone who doubts the violence of human beings, look back in history. It's everywhere. Okay. Look at the conquistadores. Look what happened to the Native Americans. Look what happened to the Maoris and the Aborigines and the San Bushmen. That if we take this, armed with extraterrestrial technology that we have acquired through shooting craft down, which is what he confirmed had been happening ever since the 1940s. And then we go out in the galaxy, justified by what he also confirmed would happen, which is a false flag alien invasion, a false flag threat, which framed the ETs as, as, as threatening to us, as hostile in some way, in very much the same way as we created the war, war on terror through 9-11. That just what happened in 2001 was that justified basically an aggressive military expansionist colonialism into Iraq and Afghanistan for all kinds of other reasons that were never made clear. And exactly the same thing. You take that, 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 that military expansionist mindset and you map it onto a galactic theatre and you've got exactly what is in danger of happening, justified by this idea that the ETs are threats, and we've, and in George Bush's words in 2001, we've got to go and smoke them out. I mean, that makes it sound laughable, but it's dangerously plausible. And many of you watching this will know that Werner von Braun actually warned his colleague Carol Rosin about this quite a long time ago. He said the next thing is going to be to set up these ETs as being violent, 
dangerous, threatening, and they're going to be the next created enemy. To justify space-based weapons, and not only space-based weapons in orbit around the planet, but space-based weapons going out into the solar system and beyond. We have this technology already. All we need is the justification. And Charles warned me that this is absolutely on the cards and is one of the plans that is, that is going to be implemented pretty soon. So what change is now? Are these people from this uh, controller group getting in touch with you, do you think? All I know is that I've been thrown a ball. Um, and the ball was thrown at me in a very strange way. It's, it's a kind of curve ball, but I caught it anyway. Um, and maybe the ball was intended for me to catch in, in, in a peculiar kind of way. The history of the contact with Charles, and once again to encapsulate this, really compress it, is that Charles disobeyed his orders, he started to support me, then he had to go on the run, he was attacked from the inside, he ended up having to flee the country, he was disenfranchised from his own life, his businesses were bankrupt, he lost millions of pounds, he was physically injured. And then when he returned to the UK eventually, in November, he was asked to report in to the controlling group, um, which was, and, and he was very smart to do that. Um, he did so, he was required to, to tell them exactly what he had done, what he had, uh, who he talked to and what his intentions were, and he was very smart to tell them the truth. And then they realized that they had an opportunity. This is, this is what I believe has happened. This was never planned, but opportunistically, they then had an indirect relationship with somebody who in the meantime had sort of passed the tests as somebody who they felt that they might be able to do business with and might be advantageous for them to establish a dialogue with in some way. That's what I mean by being thrown the ball. So Charles is playing both sides. He will cheerfully admit that. He's walking a very delicate tightrope. But there's a possibility of an outcome here in which everyone could win. I can win, we can win, as, 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 as the alternative community because we get to be told and entrusted with what the plans really are and what the problems really are. And there's, there's a litmus test in progress here. Imagine this. I know that some of you watching this think that it's all a load of nonsense, but supposing it's not. Supposing what we're being presented with is just, we're just being presented with a layout on a table of like, you want to know what's happening? Here it is. Okay. And then are we smart enough to recognize for what it is? Some people have criticized the release of information and saying, well, we knew all that anyway. Well, that's not a very, if I may say so, that's not a very intelligent critique of a release of information if it's confirmation of what we already knew. Many people would think that that was valuable. A lot of people don't, don't trust the motivation, and I can understand that as well. But it's possible that the motivation is one of taking this game to another level. As I said, it's experimental. If every single person in the alternative community rejects this information, decides that they don't want to do business, makes good, bad judgments, and decides that they're just going to go into the streets and fight, or demonstrate, or I don't know what they think they're going to do, actually, um, that might not be a constructive outcome for this. But if there's the possibility of a dialogue, if there's a possibility of an increase in understanding, if there's a possibility of, of, of something that moves this to a different level and breaks the cycle and, and starts to help us think in terms of truth and reconciliation, as I was talking before with the South African analogy, then it seems to me to be worth doing. And, and so that's what I'm doing, I'm, and I'm taking it day by day. No one's contacted me. Maybe the whole thing's a figment of my imagination. Maybe Charles is deceiving me. I don't think that's happening. And so it's an opportunity that's worth taking. It's, it, it's a gamble that's worth taking. And in the meantime, we are being presented with some very interesting information. And it's not easily digestible. It's not palatable. It's not the kind of thing we want to hear. But it might be true, and if it is true, 
We have to check it out in all of its aspects. Now, there's another aspect to this, which is a question that you haven't asked yet, and maybe you're just about to, about the philosophies on the inside. I have heard the expression purist. I think this group is calling themselves the purists. Could you elaborate on this expression? This is an important, a very important clarification. It's really, really important. It's not their own term. This is Charles's term, I believe. And let me step back and, and, and explain this a little bit, if I can. What, what was explained to me was that the controlling group has got a spectrum of approaches, because these are all individual people with individual personalities, and they interpret their responsibility not all in exactly the same way. Some of them Charles describes as being very purist, which means that in the medieval sense, and this is an analogy, if somebody, if I'm a purist and somebody steals my wife, and I'm living in the year 1800 in Britain or Europe, okay. I don't stab that guy in the back with a knife down a dark alley, even though I'm angry with him because he's stolen my wife. Okay. I challenge him to a duel because this is a matter of honour if somebody has stolen my wife. He's dishonoured me. And so I challenge him to a duel and then at dawn, six o'clock in the morning the next day, he has his musket and I have mine and then we, and then we fire at each other on a signal. And that's the honourable way to settle this. And I might not make it through, but and, and there are other ways of resolving duels with sword fights and, and they had medieval jousting and all kinds of stuff like this. This is part of the the of an ancient tradition, which is the concept of the fair contest. And this is something that Charles alluded to in his interview with me, which is published on the first of January. The idea of a fair contest. S the members of the group who are purists will allow things to happen to the extent that if a contestant presents themselves, then they are obliged to engage in the duel. They are obliged to engage in the jousting match or, or the sword fight. Because this person has challenged them in some ritualistically meaningful way, way. And so they accept that challenge. They have to. And then whatever happens, happens. Because they're allowing it to happen. It's a sort of natural progression, a sort of natural selection. So the purists will allow things to roll without interference. And my understanding is that it's the purest component of the controlling group that is holding sway here and is, and is sanctioning this release of information because, because it's there, because it's being done, because these events have happened, because Charles has taken it upon himself to take the risks to contact me, because I've taken it upon myself to take the risk of publishing this video, and because it's right there on your computer screens right now as you're watching this. This means that it is being permitted to happen and it's being permitted by the purists who are not interfering in that process, in that natural process. Now, at the other end of this spectrum, there are individuals, or there have been individuals within this group, that haven't looked upon this in exactly the same way. And it's a genuine philosophical discussion within the group. And it's not obvious, it's quite interesting, because what follows is a caricature, but I want to explain it in this way to make the point. Somebody who has a less purist attitude would say, it's okay to shoot that guy Bill Ryan in the head down a dark alley at night, or to put a bomb under his car, or to, or to, or to do whatever, um, to sort of interfere with this natural process. Um, because 
If he wasn't smart enough to figure out that that was possible and to take the necessary defensive actions, then he had it coming to him. It's like mm. all's fair in any kind of a fight. And that has its own justification as a natural rollout of events. In other words, if I wasn't smart enough to wear a bulletproof vest, then I deserve to get shot. A little bit like that. So Whereas the pure, the the other real purists wouldn't even try and shoot me. They'd just say, well, actually, we're going to let the guy speak. And then we'll find out whether the public are smart enough to pay attention to him. And if not, then the verdict of the alternative community may well be that no one's going to listen to this anyway, in which case there's nothing to worry about. But then no one can say, this is very important, then no one can say that we never told people because the protocols of this of, of, of this entire group for a long time have been to have all the information out in the open for people who are awake and aware to pick up. This is what the Georgia Guys turns are all about. This is what uh, the murals in Denver Airport are all about. It's all there. But who is it who actually really pays attention to this stuff? Only a tiny proportion of the world's population. And so from their point of view, whether whichever end of this pure spectrum they're on, they're kind of saying, well, you know what? The public is just too dumb to understand what's happening, so we're going to carry on and doing it anyway. But no one can say that we didn't actually warn them. It's, it's, it's kind of their response to the whole notion of karma. It's like they're kind of saying, well, if people are so dumb that they don't realize what's going on, they sort of deserve it. Well, that's a hard pill now, isn't it? Or a bitter pill. It's, it's Be because many people have grown up with a picture of a good God protecting us. And now we learn that the beings who control this planet are challenging us. If we're smart, if we learn, if we try to understand, if we give our best, then we are not like rebels fighting, struggling, then we are putting ourselves on a level that they take seriously. Correct. That's exactly correct, in my view. That's the way I understand mm. it. If we're smart, if we're honorable, if we pick up this ball quickly and we understand what's happening, if we respond in a way that is regarded as being appropriate, then we will be respected and then we will earn more. If we don't, if we rubbish it, if we insult them, if we say it's all crazy, if we prefer to, to stick our, in my own view, to stick our heads in the sand and listen to a lot of other stuff that in my view isn't true at all, then they're going to say, well, we told them, they didn't listen, and then they're going to carry on doing whatever it is they're going to do. Well, challenging can be quite painful, but there's a, a lot of good quality in it. The, the growing process is... It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst, exactly. So it's, it's not about good and bad, rather than the good in the bad and the bad in the good. It's the sand in the oyster that creates the pearl. Yeah. Beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. We have to have something to chew on in order to grow. I fully agree. And in this you see your role to publish enough that many people hear about this and can make their own um, decisions in life? I'm a messenger and what happens is what happens. I'm kind of being a purist myself in this. Yes. It's like, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know whether we deserve to get any more information. That's not my call to make. If I receive more information, then I will release it. I do not know what's going to happen. And I think anything can happen. And I think what happens is to some significant degree up to us.
clear. When he was asked to contact me to deal with me because I was a problem, and then he didn't do as he was asked. That's when everything changed. Okay, so behind Charles there is some kind of a group. Could you make it easier to understand for people who these people are? Yeah. In just a few moments ago, I made reference to the fact that he had spent a lot of time in the room where the decisions were made by what effectively is the capstone of the pyramid. This is not the Illuminati, it's not the Freemasons, it's not the Rosicrucians, it's not the, the Skull and Bones. It's, it's a group that's senior to all of that, that has no name. And it consists of the senior bloodline representatives, the senior representatives, uh, chosen on a particular criterion, and I don't know what that criterion is, of the 33 major bloodlines that are on the inside. Um, and th this, is all a, this is a little bit of a loose analogy, but you can regard them as families. You can regard them as families who know what's going on. Charles said that they've been in control of the planet pretty much for 17,000 years. I don't know whether that's an accurate figure, but it gives an order of magnitude that I find very believable. And this group is an international group um, based in the UK. Is the group that is calling the shots. They have tremendous power, tremendous wealth. They've had this power and this wealth for a very long time. And they are senior to every other group. It's the controlling group, as best I understand it. And these are the people who Charles has reported to and who has worked with and who knows in person. It's, it's, it's as senior as it gets while you stay on this planet. I would like to know a little bit more about this group. So this is Bill Ryan from Project Avalon, and it's Sunday the 9th of January 2011, and I'm making this little video with the help of my friend Ruth, who is known as Sepio on the Project Avalon forum, and she's supporting me here with a question and answer session to enhance and to complement the video interview with an insider with the pseudonym of Charles, which I released on the 1st of January. Uh, right now, as I talked to you, it's nine days ago. And that interview had had an interesting response. Um, it was a little bit like dropping a big rock in the pond, and the ripples have been spreading and the boats have been rocking, and a lot of people got quite upset, and people said all kinds of stuff, none of which is true. But it does need a backstory, it does need some enlargement, it does need a commentary. And this is what Ruth is going to assist me with today. Ruth, do you want to say hello to the people watching yeah. the video? People might know me from the Avalon Forum under my name, Sepia. And here I find myself in this funny situation, sitting behind the camera, trying to ask you questions. But would you like to tell again how you met Charles? Okay. Um, the story is told in the interview itself. The summary is that uh, he emailed me with brevity and courtesy and suggested that it would be valuable for me to talk to him. I picked up the importance of the message and on the 1st of August we talked on Skype for four hours. It was one of the more extraordinary conversations uh, in my life. And he introduced himself by saying that he had been ordered to deal with me because I had become a problem. And then he said that he wasn't going to do as he was ordered, and uh, instead he was going to support what I was doing because he'd found out a little bit about who I was. 
And once again, the story of that is told in the interview. We met eventually on the 18th of December, where to my surprise, because I never thought it would happen, he consented to a video interview that was recorded with his real voice, but with his, his face hidden. That's what this commentary is all about. Before you met him in person, you spoke to him quite some time. Oh yeah, I, um, we logged over several months, over 30 hours of Skype conversations. What kind of a person is he? He is somebody who was used by the insiders as a resource for them. His job was to make problems go away. He would probably smile when I said that he's the kind of person who one would be glad to have on one's side when faced with a problem or any kind of a situation. He is intelligent. He does not have a formal education. He's not an academic. He's not a historian. He's not a scientist. He was a resource. He was an asset of the controlling group and spent many years uh, attending meetings. He was in the room where the decisions were made by the global controllers about uh, events and decisions that they were making about global affairs. So he, he was trusted, he's smart, he's cautious about what he says, he's honest, he has shown to me that he keeps his word, I would say he's tremendously courageous and I would say that he's one of these people who one could uh, one could describe probably quite accurately as being uncontrollable. Does Charles have any special abilities like psychic abilities? He's got some remarkable psychic abilities, very strong psychic abilities which I've experienced at first hand and others who he's been in communication with have experienced as well. It does seem like, like many, many of the insiders, who you could call the insiders, some of them insiders in intelligence, we've encountered this before, and some of them in the bloodline families, they have these abilities, they have psychic powers. I mean, that sounds very esoteric. Um, Charles says, this is nothing special. It's just a natural process. It's a natural thing that everyone's got. But, um, the, but the public have been educated to believe that these things are unreal, they're imaginary, they're, they're somehow kind of new agey mumbo jumbo and they're to be laughed at, and they are not. They're used as tools of the trade by the insiders and by um, people in Charles's role, which is a kind of quasi-military role. They use these abilities. So in that case, he would be a perfect person for some kind of intelligence group or any organization who need a person with special abilities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know, for example, that the, uh, that the Russians and the Americans have spent billions of dollars on research programs trying to enhance people's abilities for remote viewing, remote influencing. They, uh, there was all the work that was done by Hal Putoff and company in the in the Stanford Research Institute of the 1970s uh, with Yuri Geller and Ingo Swan. All of this is very well documented in the public domain. Mm. Uh, Jim Myers wrote a wonderful book about this called Psy Spies. But when you've got somebody who's already a bloodline member, as Charles is, and who has these abilities, he was born with these abilities, he, didn't, he, he had a little bit of an enhancement, meaning he was trained and he had some of these things brought out. But basically, he was born with these abilities, and so they use these resources that they have available to them. That's why he, one of the reasons why he was inducted into their world, not only because he was a warrior, and because he was smart and capable, and he was able to make their problems go away for them, but also because of his abilities that, as he described, often prevented problems from rising in the first place. And that's better than having a fight on your hands. So we could actually say that he didn't have a chance to choose a different way in his life. He was brought up in this tradition, so to speak. He was singled out from a very early age when he was a kid. 
he'd been watched all the time. He didn't realise what was happening until he was into his late teens and twenties. That's when he realised that there was more to him than he knew, but other people had been watching him all the time. In the meantime, when he was young, he was a hooligan, and, he, and his, 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 um, uh, his capabilities in that, in that um, world were, were, were noticed and taken advantage of. For instance, he describes, I don't think this is in the video, but he told me how when he was a teenager, he was utilised to go into um, Greenpeace demonstrations and cause trouble so that the demonstrators would, would be um, uh, antagonised by the police and so on and so forth. We know that this kind of thing happens. We don't often get the chance to talk to someone who says, yeah, I did that kind of thing, I was, I was asked to do it, and so I did. Why did he suddenly decide to work together with you? Yeah, that, that's, this is a critical question. As he describes in his interview, um, he, had a, he had a certain experience which effectively deprogrammed him. And this is a bit of a caricature, I'm, I'm sort of encapsulating this. But he woke up and he thought, wait a minute, I don't have to do all this stuff mindlessly that they're asking me to do. I'm my own man and I can make my own decisions. And that's what he started to do. Now he didn't announce it to them straight away, that became 